Hello and welcome. Now, I would like to start by acknowledging the Indigenous land we all reside on. Currently, I am speaking to you all from the shared territory belonging to the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Huron Wendat Nation. Indigenous rights are human rights. Non natives must stand in solidarity with our Indigenous siblings and ensure that these recent and ongoing discoveries do not become a trend. I encourage all non natives to continue listening to Indigenous leaders. And as a first step, use resources like native-land.ca to find out whose land you're on. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Desiree Green. I'm a writer, director, producer, a very recent graduate, a Ryerson's media production program, and also the spearheader of Envision. Now, Envision is a two-part initiative looking to continue the action and conversation around inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility within children's programming. The conversation part of the initiative is the panel, and the action part is a pitch package that myself, along with a handful of other Ryerson students and professionals have been putting together for a kids show. So tonight we are going to premiere the animated teaser for that, and we hope you enjoy. I hope that got you just as excited as we are. Now on to the main event. Our first panelist is the co-founder of Big Bad Boo Studios and the creator of the award-winning shows, 16 Hudson and The Bravest Night. Please help me welcome Shavnam Rezai. Our Hi, second- Hey, Shabnam. <laughs> Our second panelist is an award-winning disabled writer, producer, and performer, and also the creator of Hashtag Crypt the Script. Please help me welcome Ophira Kaloff. Hey, Ophira. And our third panelist is not only a daytime Emmy nominated actor for his role on Androids, but is also a talented writer who has written for shows such as Total Drama Rama and the Emmy award winning show Dino Dana. He's also a TV creator with two shows in development, one of them being a teen supernatural series versus entertainment. Please help me welcome Hadiel Dowlin. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, Hadiel. Now, I'd like to start the conversation off by reflecting on the current landscape of language in the industry and how we use words like diversity as well as inclusion and disability. I'd like to start off with Ophira. So I'm an able-bodied woman and uh, over this past year, I've really started to immerse myself in disabled spaces, specifically Twitter, and I have learned a lot. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the word disabled, specifically what it means to be a disabled creative versus a creative who has a different ability, um, as well as a little bit about hashtag Crypt the Script. I love this question so much. Um, <laughs> thank you for it. Um, first of all, I think language is personal. So I always want to start with putting that out there. You know, everybody has a different relationship to what words uh, they feel represent them. Um, but I very strongly identify as a disabled person, um, and I put disability first. And that's taken me quite a while to get to. Um, I'm someone who sort of acquired a disability a bit later in life. And I first really started saying things like, oh, I'm not disabled. I'm just, I just have things. Or, oh, I'm not disabled. I'm differently abled. Um, and when I started to immerse myself in the community a bit more and really reflect a little bit, um, I realized that that was because I thought being disabled was bad, that there was something shameful about it, that it made me lesser. And so I was trying to tell the world that I'm just as capable as anyone else. I'm not disabled. Um, instead of saying, wait a minute, I am disabled and, and that's cool. That's fine. Um, yeah, it involves having to move through this world in different ways, sometimes really challenging ways. Um, but there's also really beautiful parts of that as well, and it's part of who I am. I can't really separate it out of myself. Um, and that, that kind of idea is what led into Crip the Script. Uh, Crip is sort of a reclamation of a word that's been used as an insult against disabled people for a very long time. Um, and it's kind of taking that word back and saying, yeah, yeah, you know what, <laughs> this is this is true and it's us and, and we're still here and we're still doing things. Um, and when I talk about Crypt the Script now, I'm talking about taking a story 
and then taking the whole way we build a story, the way we tell it, the way we write, our collaboration, our production, and doing it in a way that centers disability knowledge and experience and community, um, which comes into play not only just having disabled characters and narratives, but also thinking through how accessibility might be part of the art itself, switching the process, flipping it on its head in a way that embraces uh, all of the all of the really cool things that come when you have a bunch of people who have to navigate the world in different ways. So I'm very team of reclaim the language. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something very beautiful about, or I guess very resilient about that, you know. Um, now, I'd like to pivot and talk a little bit about the word diversity. Um, Shadam, you actually said something very interesting on a panel you recently spoke at. You said, diversity is an outsider's concept. So I'd like to ask you all, how are words like diversity used and what are the effects it has on the industry? Um, Shabnam, if we can start with you. Sure. Um, you know, when I said that about diversity, what I meant was um, that, like, for example, when I wake up in the morning, I don't look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm a diverse person. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is I'm just a person. And, um, you know, after a while of being presented through that lens to everyone and the conversation always being around diversity, um, it's, it's tiresome as a creator or writer or director or any kind of type of creative where sometimes in conferences and panels where you're with your peers, you want to discuss themes and topics, you want to discuss content, and um, it just gets overshadowed and completely taken over by this conversation around diversity. Um, it's, to me, the white man's lens on everything that's not white, cis, male, able-bodied, um, heterosexual um, person moving around. So um, I see the world and I see like so many different types of people. And for me, that's normal. Uh, when I talk to a person, I don't think about them as, oh, this person is African-American or this person is whatever the, the tag is, um, I, I like to hope that I connect with their humanity first. And so um, it's, it's a challenge though, because you know, with all the movements we've had in the last few years, everything from the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter, uh, to coronavirus, just making the world turn upside down where we have had to really reflect on who we are as a society, what we've done right and what we've done wrong. Um, there's no better time to be talking about these things. I don't want to take away from the importance of talking about it and keeping it at our forefront. Um, there's another side of it that bothers me, which is that we have a lot of diversity panels going on and a lot of conversation on diversity. And what I notice is that the people that are coming to the events are people that are affected by it as opposed to everyone coming to it. And I don't feel we can affect change until everyone is engaged, truly engaged. So another example was I, um, we were at an, uh, at an Iranian American women's professional uh, conference and someone said, and it was 98% female uh, attendees. And someone said, you know, until the men attend this conference, we can't really affect change. Well, it's the same thing. We could sit here and talk about diversity and inclusion but until the people who have had the privilege show up as well, we can't really start to affect change. And so I wanna take the conversation to the next level, which is how do we do that? Hadiel, do you have any thoughts? For sure, yeah, well said Shabnam, I don't know how I'm gonna to top that. Um, but in, in terms of you know, what the word diversity means to me, I think it signifies a need for representation in media, of course. Um, I mean, only a decade ago, panels like these weren't happening. And if they were, they weren't as mainstream and we weren't really seeing people like ourselves reflected in media. Um, so I'd say, yeah, for the most part, I think mandates for diversity have increased on screen representation, but also with that, I also think tropes as well. I mean, I'm an actor and I've auditioned for hundreds of parts 
And as a result of diversity, a lot of them, you know, tend to be like the token black character and they tend to only be surface level diversity. And so what I mean by that is the fact there's no nuance to these characters. The character could be, let's say, Tommy and it just says black. You know, we don't really get to see whether they're black Caribbean or African or Afro Latino, like my spell, like myself, black people who speak Spanish, uh, black Muslims, like there's just a a variety of Black people who come from many different backgrounds and uh, diversity as a whole, sometimes that term can lead to the oversimplification of marginalized groups and it applies to many groups too. I know like uh, for, for gay people as well in media, oftentimes gay men are personified as feminine. It's, it's sort of like a stereotype and how um, disabled people as well are, are typically seen as uh, physically disabled. Like I'd like to see a lot more neuro, uh, neuro visibility, neuro disability as well. Um, so in terms of next steps, I'd say we should foster inclusivity, maybe use that word instead. It sounds more inclusive in the name and um, also have more cultural nuance, nuance rather, and not only in front of the camera, but also behind it, because that's the space which is most homogenous, uh, which is typically led by uh, white guys in positions of power. So yeah, inclusivity in front of the camera and behind the camera, I think will ultimately lead to change. Yeah, I think you made a good point about um, intersectionality kind of being thrown out the window and one identity being presented as kind of like what you said, like this service kind of representation. Um, Ophira, do you have any additional thoughts? Oh, goodness. I agree with all of this so strongly. Um, about once a week, I, I act as well. And about once a week, I get a breakdown that for maybe a commercial or something in that realm, there will be a number of characters listed. There's one that says, you know, a young woman in, in her 20s, she's like a bit sassy and bubbly and has a sharp fashion sense. Um, a man in his 50s who's kind of gruff, a little bit of a fisherman type. Um, a child who's like into X, Y, Z. And then a person with a disability, any gender, age five to 95. <laughs> all the time once a week I'm telling you and I kind of look at it and I go okay <laughs> all right um and I think that really speaks to like sure I'm glad that I that it came in front of me and uh you know great but approximately one in four uh people are disabled so uh that's that's a lot of people that are being lumped in to checking a box essentially and i i think that yeah language matters the more that we we kind of other and separate um and put these conversations in a category um i think the more that that becomes reflected in casting calls but also in writers rooms in production teams in uh mandates in general and the way that mandates are shaped is it just to to hit a certain number of people, or is it to think about that uh, that intersectionality, that meaningful, uh, exciting possibility of telling authentic stories? I'd like to ask as a follow up question, because um, Hadiel, you brought up bringing out some of the nuances in in culture. What do you say to people who, especially like in kids content, who say it's like a little bit too much in terms of what kids can handle? Yeah, I, I'd say it's only too much because we haven't seen it. I mean, once you normalize something, uh, well, then it'll be normalized and it, it'll be like the new status quo. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you constantly put out in, in green light content, which features, you know, white male straight leads, that's going to be the norm and a show featuring a black Latino protagonist or a disabled protagonist, an LGBT crack protagonist will be seen as other. So once those quote unquote other things become like the mainstream and the norm, it'll be accepted overall and those projects will be supported by the decision makers uh, more than the projects of the past, which have become and are more homogenous. So. Um, so I feel like something that you guys are all collectively hitting on is that in the industry, your value is often placed on the fact that you are diverse and that you are marginalized and not on the fact that regardless, you're just great storytellers. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about your work and your journeys. Um, so I'd like to start off with you, Hadiel. 
um, you know, aside from being really young in general, it can be very difficult to transition from one career to the next. Uh, what were some of the challenges you faced transitioning from an actor to a writer? And as a follow up question, what are some of the skills and lessons you learned in those high profile writing rooms that you're now implementing as a showrunner? Well, no challenges whatsoever. It's been pretty much smooth sailing. So <laughs> I'm kidding. That, that was more of a fictional response than anything I've written for. Um, yes, I had my fair share of challenges. Um, the first one actually, which comes to mind, doesn't have to do with ethnicity. It's actually ageism. So I, I found that, you know, the writing industry tends to equate youth with inexperience. The fact that I didn't have a writing degree. I mean, I was a philosophy major even at the time. I didn't have an agent or credits meant that I really wasn't taken seriously. Um, so I found that, you know, I'd have a best case scenario, really great pitch meetings with lots of positive reception, but then be ghosted by production companies months after, or um, worst case scenario, I'd, I'd get a response, but it'd be like a long rant explaining why my show wouldn't fit the market. Uh, that show would let it later be, uh, you know, placed in development with some awesome players. So I had the last laugh, um, but that's not to, you know, discourage anyone. It's, it's just to say that those things can come up at times. And if you endure them, you can come up on the other side, very successful. Um, and, you know, comparing it to the acting industry, the acting industry tends to equate, you know, youth with potential. That's why you see so many child actors who have no credits, but end up being huge stars. So that's just something I had to adjust to. Um, and um, also I'd say I had to advocate for myself a lot more as well. Uh, many actors attending today may know that, you know, in the acting industry, you have agents which send you out for gigs and, and fight for you and negotiate for you and all that kind of stuff. And in, in the world of writing, that seldom happens. Usually you have to get your gigs yourself and fight for yourself and advocate for yourself. And uh, the people who don't have to do that tend to be big shots. That's where, that's the kind of people the agents actually support. And since I obviously wasn't one at the time, you know, I had to go to a lot of networking conferences and pitch myself to showrunners and defend all the creative choices I made. Um, and this all coincides, I think, with uh, what Shabnam actually said uh, at one of the first panels I actually um, viewed of hers before I had any of the credits I have now. And she had said that the grind never stops, even when you're established. And uh, that's something that, you know, at the time, I didn't think she was telling the truth. I thought she was being humble. But no, that's that's absolutely 100% true. I found that even now having a show in development with Chorus, you think it'd be smooth sailing, but no, you're still, you know, nudging people, trying to get replies from them, trying to encourage them to take your projects to the next step. So that grind is something that definitely continues. Um, and then in terms of, you know, other things I've learned in my transition from acting to uh, writing, I, I found that I was even a little bit in a diversity bubble, so to speak. I was a bit naive to the fact that the writing industry did have, you know, hypocrisy in, in, in some ways, in the sense that I, you know, I came from in a sector where all the shows I acted on were incredibly inclusive and we had fully realized characters and it was nuanced. And then I found that as a writer, the same people were posting like blacks, you know, black squares and were allies during the Black Lives Matter movement, thought my diverse show wasn't universal enough, AKA white enough. Um, and so, yeah, I was blown away by the fact that my idols, uh, some of them didn't support my inclusivity uh, unless it was 100% profitable. And, and, you know, to give an anecdote to that, I remember attending Kid Screen uh, last year, 2020, and I was really passionate about my diverse project and I pitched it out to several people and I got essentially no interest. And then during the Black Lives Matter movement, it was basically a, a bidding war for, for who would get it. And so I think that right there kind of encompasses how, you know, it's, it's unfortunate how at times diverse stories aren't really seen unless trauma is tied to them and that, that ultimately is what humanizes them and, and fosters interest. And so I'd like to see people take an interest in, in diverse projects, not just, not just because it's, you know, trending on Twitter, but because uh, they see them as, as stories which need to be told as well. Um, I'd also say, you know, patience was something I had to learn in the acting industry. I, although you have to be patient in it, typically you can audition for something and find out you get the part in a couple months. With writing, it's a very slow process with development. It can take year, a year up to several years. And uh, that said, I would say to everyone who still wants to pursue that career, there is a great return in it. I mean, you really can change the world with TV and film. And, and I really mean that, I, I'm not being dramatic. I mean, if you think about it, TV is a form of media that media ultimately can impact culture, which impacts norms and policy and society. So you can actually affect political change with the right show, the right film. Um, in terms of some of the skills I learned from these writing rooms and how I applied them to my, uh, my own show, 
I'd say that I found that the higher profile writing room I was in, the less diverse people I saw. And I remember specifically for one of the biggest shows I, I was a part of, I was the only person of color. So I just knew that that's something I had to change when I had the opportunity to show run my own show. Um, and so, yeah, I found very diverse, qualified writers and ones who complemented the characters in my world and the themes. Um, another learning curve of, of that aspect too was the fact that, you know, the TV and film industry is a collaboration and you really have to be nimble and let others improve your idea. And I remember on like Total Drama Rama, how ultimately I even endured my own growing pains. Like I, I grew up watching Total Drama and I was like, I have the best idea for this episode. I'll pitch it to everyone. And we remember, I remember entering the room and everyone just started like tearing it apart. And I'm like, no, what are you doing to my child? This is awful. But ultimately that open-mindedness is what led to that you know, story being much, much better. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd say also to everyone watching that, if the reason why you want to you know, create a show is because you want to see the credit created by in your name, just keep in mind, typically a hundred people are behind the creation of a, of a project or so. So if you're more of a solitary creative, maybe write a novel and it'll get adapted to a short movie one day. I mean, it worked out for Stephen King. Um, but yeah, you really have to be a team player if you want to be in this industry. Um, and yeah, so I guess I'd close it off with saying, um, ultimately what I learned from the transition from writing to acting and being involved in rooms was the fact you shouldn't categorize people um, I mean, I acted on a, on a show called Androids, as Desiree mentioned, and the production company for that show was Sinking Ship Entertainment. And they gave me the opportunity to write on the show called Daniel Dana when I was 17. And so they didn't categorize me or limit me based on my past career. And so I felt similarly, I shouldn't categorize myself in that, you know, I had only up to that point really written for uh, kids projects and acted in kids stuff. And so from seeing how someone else treated me, I was confident enough to decide, well, I could do something bold and different too. And that's what inspired me to uh, create my own teen supernatural show, though it's not something I was known for at the time. Um, and naturally that ensured, that had me ensured to myself that I would open up my room to all kinds of writers uh, from all kinds of backgrounds too. So, yeah. I love that. Um, death to the ego and being able to, like being brave enough to, uh, to do things outside of the box. Um, I'd love to pivot to Shabnam now. Now, I personally love co-viewing series. Um, I'm talking like Hippo in the Age of Wonder Bees, Avatar Lost of Airbender, Miraculous, shows that are entertaining enough for kids to be hooked, but also have a humor level where parents or young adults like me will still be interested. I think you've really hit this beautiful balance in The Bravest Night. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process in creating the episode structure, especially for a younger audience, you know, five plus, how did you combine flipping back and forth between past and present while also fusing episodic storylines, problems that are solved in one episode with underlying tones of serialization, a storyline that continues over multiple episodes? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that. Um, to kind of uh, talk a little bit about The Bravest Night, I guess uh, I should explain the premise a little bit. Uh, the book, um, there was initially a book, uh, a children's book called The Bravest Night Who Ever Lived, which is available. Um, and it was written by Daniel Errico, who's the creator of the series. Daniel uh, initially wrote the story. Uh, and in that story, the prince and the knight meet and they get married at the end of the story. And our series takes off after they're married and they're living in the, in the palace with their uh, young daughter, Nia, who is eight years old. She's behind me in that photo. Um, and in every episode, essentially, Nia um, has a greater goal of becoming the, the bravest knight like her father, Cedric. And in every episode, um, Cedric is teaching her a lesson about knighthood. Uh, so that's sort of like an analogy for us for life, you know, how to be a good human. Um, the things that a knight typically does are those things. And so we're hoping to dispense with a general lesson for the kids in each episode through what Nia is going through. And what's great about the series is that we get to go back in time. And Cedric, uh, who is now a little boy, um, and kind of meet him as a young man trying to become a knight and his journey. So when we go back in time in these stories, uh, Cedric has uh, just met a purple troll named Grunt, played by Bobby Moynihan, and Grunt has lost his bridge. You know, trolls have bridges and they collect money and he can't find his bridge. So Cedric vows to help Grunt help uh, find that bridge. And in doing so, he hopes to earn his way to knighthood. 
Now, in the land where they are, um, this very evil red dragon has released all the villains from fairy jail. And so um, Cedric's greater mission is to find this red dragon and help uh, bring all the villains back into fairy jail. So that's sort of like how we've built the structure, which is that we have the outside episodic, which is the family unit, uh, the prince, the knight, and Nia. And Grunt is also there. We meet Grunt because he's stayed all this time with them. And now he's older, but he's just as funny. And so every episode opens up with a lesson. We jump back into, you know, what it means to be a knight. Uh, you know, knights need to know how to swim. And let me tell you a story about that time I learned how to swim. And so we jump back into a story with Cedric and uh, Grunt, and then we'll meet a fairy tale uh, villain. It could be the big bad wolf. Only ours is a really sweet wolf. Um, our big bad wolf was played by RuPaul and uh, turns out his name is Stanley and he's just misunderstood. Um, so there's a great story with Stanley and how uh, everyone treats him really poorly and thinks he's like huffing and puffing all the houses down where he's really not doing that. He's just trying to blow all the leaves because it's fall and they don't have leaf blowers and he's trying to clean up the neighborhood. Um, it's very funny. <laughs> so um, essentially, uh, the larger theme is that Cedric is looking for the red dragon in every episode and he moves from town to town looking for the red dragon. And in each episode we meet a new villain. And then we go back to the framing story where Nia has learned her lesson. And our first season is over 13 episodes. By the end of the 13th episode, we find the red dragon. And um, I won't tell you what happens uh, because we're hoping for season two. Uh, but essentially, that's how we try to weave um, the uh, various storylines, the story A, B, and C through the, uh, through the series. I think what's also clever about The Bravest Night is that it's the first time um, a show has been able to have a, a gay protagonist in a young boy. Uh, through this uh, travel mechanism to when he's young, and that's new because you know, when we're creating shows and let's say 16 Hudson, one of our shows where the kids are little, uh, you can't really have LGBTQ uh, other than a family structure. You can't say that one of the characters uh, may be gay or, or not because they're way too little and way too young. But this way, not only are we showing a family structure between uh, Cedric, Nia and, um, and the prince, but we also are able to have a protagonist. Uh, which is going on these adventures and we're learning from him. So that is a fantastic role model. And uh, we thought it was a great way to showcase um, all those different themes. Yeah, and I think uh, what you were talking about with Cedric and even just kind of like the way he's presented, it's not in a, a super feminine way. It's just like, he's just a boy, he's just a kid and he's trying to be a knight. Like, it's just very- Yeah, he's a pumpkin humanized. farmer and he doesn't want to be a pumpkin farmer and is really into like becoming a knight. So he earns yeah. his way to becoming a knight and he really deserves it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to pivot to Ophira now. Um, so there's a lot- a lot of research and conversation around body representation within the kids space but one thing I don't think has been explored or explored that much is the concept of body neutrality. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your work literally titanium and how some of the themes you explore could benefit disabled kids. Um, I, I would love to. Uh, I guess a little bit of context about literally titanium. Um, I literally titanium started as just just a tiny dream of mine um, and it turned into an hour long solo show that was a sort of comedic cabaret style show um, that I got to premiere at the 2020 Next Stage Theatre Festival. I was one of the only people who got a show uh, live in 2020 uh, before everything shut down, which was uh, quite quite lucky uh, to have had that experience. And literally Titanium was a show that was based around the, the relationship between my mind and body. I separated out mind and body as two characters. I called my mind Mindy and said that she was taking a little bit of a break. She was giving me the body center stage to air out my feelings and have a moment, essentially. Um, and that came out of the idea that 
I have found myself for so long saying things like, oh, you know, my body hates me, you know, when I really was having high pain days or if I would fall, I feel like, oh, you know, my body is doing X, Y, Z. It's not me, it's my body. Um, and that separation, I, I started to wonder um, just what that was doing to my perception of myself um, and to, to sort of everyone and, and the world around us. I think that body positivity is this huge movement and there's a lot of great things about it, um, but it does not necessarily include disability. Um, it doesn't necessarily include space for conversations about pain, fatigue, um, and things that are really hard within a body. Um, it focuses a lot on health and the idea that, oh, it's okay as long as you're healthy, but what if you're not healthy? You know, what if, what if in fact you live with a chronic illness? Uh, where is, how are you supposed to feel about your body, um, yourself? And so in the show, I really sort of went on this journey of giving my body center stage and the chance to, to think through all of that, to explore all of those feelings through song and dance and all of, all of that fun stuff. Um, and what it meant to, to just be uh, and what it meant to kind of move through the world um, specifically as you know, a body that's marginalized in this world um, and navigate it in a way that is neither good nor bad, it just is. There's no judgment associated with it. Um, and at one of the shows, uh, there actually was someone in the front row, um, a, young, a young kid uh, in a wheelchair. And I, because they were right there, um, right in front of me, I just kept noticing that they were torn between watching me with these just wide, wide eyes. But also every time I finished a song and people clapped, they kept looking around to see like, what are other people, like other people are seeing this too? Like other people, oh wow. Um, and you know, we chatted a little bit afterwards. And I think it's just so essential to have the space to to explore those ideas, to know that your body is not wrong, it's not bad, and you don't have to love it all the time. You can just be, and you can still dance on stage, and you can still wear sparkly clothes if you want to, or not if you don't want to. Um, you can sing opera, I sing opera on the stage. Um, it wasn't all necessarily having to be meaningful. I also just had fun and celebrated in the body that I have. Um, and I know that that would have made such a difference to me as a kid. Um, and so I'm hoping, hoping for more of that and to create more of that. Yeah, I think that ties back into uh, what we were talking about earlier with including more um, different, different lived experiences and even just with a lot of ideas with how, especially like younger kids um, tolerate or regulate their emotions. Um, but I'd like to transition and wrap with one final question that gets back to the issue at hand. How do we move away from a space of othering diverse creators and into a space where we normalize difference, both in content and in the industry? Let's start off with you, Hadio. Mm -hmm. Um, so first off, I'd say kudos to you, Desiree. I think you're doing it. Like, frankly, community building panels like these are what inspired me to to you know endure the tough days when they when they came by and it really fosters a, a community of diverse people who want their stories to be you know told and seen so yeah more of this would be great um i'd also say we should invest and continue to support uh result oriented opportunities that are inclusive to everyone so for instance the youth media alliance andrew shepherd scholarship is what led to me uh, attending Kids Screen in, in Banff. And so that was an opportunity for me to pitch networks and meet executives on the other side of the world that I would not have had a chance to interact with aside from that scholarship. So scholarships like that, as opposed to ones which are more internship based, I think will, will lead to more results. Um, and you know, on that note, I'm actually leading a, a couple uh, initiatives with the Youth Media Alliance as one of their board members. Uh, one's, one is called the YMA Student Webinars. And that hopes to educate students like the ones attending today about the robust children's media industry. 
And uh, in, I think especially in, in times like these where youth unemployment has skyrocketed, I think that'll open up you know, many perspectives and allow people to understand that there is room for, for employment there. And we're also giving away uh, student memberships or YMA student memberships as well for attendees. Uh, so I think that's a, a way of you know, bringing in action to the cause. Um, also leading the John Rooney Taffy Scholarship, which is a, a $40,000 scholarship which supports LGBT2S plus writers and animators. Um, and yeah, feel free to follow me to stay tuned about all of that. But I think scholarships are, are really the key and in initiatives like that, which are action-based are the key to ensure inclusivity is you know, more than just a talking point at panels that people act upon it. Um, I'd, I'd also say too, that we need to eradicate the sort of like do your time mentality I found that a lot of talented uh, creatives, uh, diverse creatives specifically, are often relegated to positions of shadowing or you know, being someone's assistant. And I think those are fine. Those are great ways to start and to network. Uh, but when you're sort of slotted into that section, not because you, know, you yourself want to, but because others are saying you're young and you should you know, just work your way up, I think that can be something that's harmful and condition people to sort of think less of themselves and not be bold and not be ambitious. Um, and then lastly, I'd say, you know, to understand, this is more to the, the uh, people in position of power, but, you know, understand that potential can equal profit. And so I think typically those in positions of power associate professionals with profit. And so they kind of think that those who just show potential um, are more of a liability and aren't really worth the risk. And so I think, you know, once those people who we view with potential um, are actually given the chance to have someone invested in them, then that will lead to them ultimately being a professional and ultimately that being a profitable move on behalf of the company. And I'm a testament to that. I mean, I've, I've never show run a show and yet, you know, core sinking ship in Novana, uh, believed in my vision, believed in me. And, you know, here I am getting to co show run my show. So yeah, I think we need more people in positions of power uh, making moves like that. I'd like to pivot to Shabnam now. Yes, um, everyone just says such wonderful things. I don't even know what to say, but um, I, I would echo everything that um, my co-panelists are saying here in terms of, you know, affecting change is all about uh, engagement and being vocal and not being afraid to say what's on your mind. Um, Hillary Clinton famously said, uh, women's rights are human rights. And I have to keep going back to the fact that we are all human. And in order to normalize us, we have to speak at that level. So diverse stories are human stories. When someone says your story is too niche, it's not gonna fly on our channel. They're not the right channel for you because your story is a human story and you need to just keep pushing until you find the person who sees that. Right? To me, that's like, that opens everything up. That opens everything up. The sun is shining, find the right people, find your people, find your champions. And, you know, if you get a hundred no's, remember that you just need one yes. You need one yes to get to where you're going. So those are things that are really important to keep in mind. The daily grind is very difficult. And, you know, there are so many things in the last few years that we as a tiny little industry have put together. Um, Hadiel mentioned some of them. Uh, at my company, Big Bad Boo, we started a BIPOC workshop this past year for not just writing, which is something we do a lot of out of Toronto, uh, but also I noticed in my own studio in Vancouver, we were uh, not gender balanced in certain departments and we didn't have enough creatives of color in certain departments. So we did a uh, workshop for three areas, animation, storyboarding and writing. And we hope to make it an annual event. So for those of you who are looking to attend something like that, it's free. Uh, you can just stay tuned to the Big Bad Boo uh, new stuff and, and catch the next one. You can apply for that. Um, I think continuing to attend events, engage in these community um, discussions is super important. Um, like Hadiel, who mentioned a couple of specific things, um, I want to just say the Children's Media Conference in the UK is happening next week, and they have openings for free tickets for students. 
Um, so that's available. Uh, I know it's in the UK, but uh, you can never have enough friends uh, in this industry because it is a global industry and things like co-productions happen. So if you have friends in the UK that maybe one day want to do a co-production with Canada, that's a great thing to be thinking about even right now as you're writing your pitch or writing your script or thinking about that next idea. So um, yeah, that's it for me in terms of some thoughts. Thank you. I'd like to pivot to Ophira now. I mean, I agree so strongly with everything that's been said. Um, so I won't, I won't repeat, but well, I'll repeat one thing just because I think it's so important. Um, community, community um, and diving into community on all levels, I think is so essential. Um, and one thing I'll quickly shout out, I work um, a fair bit with the Real Abilities Film Festival um, and there's a number of programs associated with, with that festival um, and opportunities. So uh, I'm teaching a sketch comedy class starting tomorrow. Uh, so things in that realm, I think building up community on a personal level, on a professional level, on an industry level um, is so essential. But also, I think something that I'm I'm trying to internalize myself and say out loud to people as much as possible is that you have you have more power than you probably think you do. Um, there's this idea often in navigating the industry that it's set and you have to kind of mold yourself to fit in certain ways. You get notes, you have to integrate those notes. There's a structure of a writer's room. You have to fit into that structure. There's only, there's a certain schedule. That's the day you have to do. Um, and as, uh, as everyone's really mentioned, but sort of this pathway, this progression, the putting in your time, all of that. Um, and the fact of the matter is that system just doesn't work for everyone, um, especially for anyone who's bringing any sort of marginalized experience to the table. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, in all of my productions now, we shift our timelines dramatically to account for different access needs. And it's an ongoing discussion about how we can shape a production timeline in a way that creates space for people to have medical emergencies, for people to have bad days, for people to be able to be honest about those things so that they can bring their best selves and their best work to the table. Um, and that starts so early in the process so that we can then build a platform that we can bring people into and know that they too have that space to bring forward their best work, their best selves, um, because we've structured things accordingly. And I, I think that that shift in framework and that idea that truly, I mean, we're making up stories here. Anything is possible. Um, and it sometimes feels like it's not. But if I can say one major thing is that is that you have a bit more power uh, to shape it. I love that idea of like framework shift. And I think kind of going off what Hattie was saying before, like knowing that you do have the ability to change um, and to produce content that isn't out there already. Now, I'm going to open it up to a 10 minute Q&A. So um, attendees, please type your questions, not in the chat box, but the Q&A box. Okay, so we have one question. Um, someone asks, I'm struggling with writing and turning off my inner critic slash fitting my, fitting my writing into a specific format. Do you have any tips for that? I could, I could go ahead and, and start us off for that one. Um, I, uh, that's something I struggle with so much. So I relate, you are not alone by a long shot. Um, I, I encourage um, everyone that I, that I work with in all of my classes to um, take a moment and put a timer on and say every single thing I have to say is valid. A typo doesn't matter. You can fix a typo. You can fix grammar. You can change the structure later. You can anything you can you can kind of edit and fix later. 
Um, and it's so hard to do at first, but I have everyone start with just two minutes and I do it to myself. I set my timer and say every single thing that I have to say right now is valid and cool and something can come of it and just essentially word vomit out onto the page. And sometimes it's random ideas, sometimes it's lists, sometimes it's words, but there's something there. And I think society tells us so often that maybe it isn't valid or maybe we have to make sure it's just right. Um, but no one's seeing your first draft. I put vomit drafts at the top of mine so that I know it's just for me and whatever I have to say, I can shape it later. Um, yeah, your first draft doesn't have to be shared. Yeah, um, yeah, if I could jump in, I, I'd say like, you know, I, I like to think, or like, I like the, the figure of speech rather, right, like no one's watching, because no one is watching, you know, there's no one judging you, but you really, um, I'd also say, you know, you mentioned format, keep in mind, format is really just a guideline. I mean, some of the most imaginative films and shows out there have broken uh, the mold, so to speak. Um, so yeah, don't tie yourself to any specific format whatsoever. Um, if you're facing writer's block, I'd say maybe take a look at what the themes are of the thing you're writing and, and really, uh, you know, tr make sure your, your characters are fully developed and, and multidimensional. I find that when you really know what the themes are of the piece you're writing and who the characters are, it tends to really just write itself. Um, and lastly, I'll say that there's a quote by Taika Waititi. Uh, I saw it just today, actually, it's very fitting. And that's that writing is actually rewriting. So no one, as Ophira said, really just pumps out, you know, a first draft, which is fantastic. Great writers are, are ones who can, you know, do that first draft, make it be vomit, and it just, you know, continually work at it and work at it until it's something that's really awesome and, and presentable. I just want to add to this, which is that I do all of those things that you guys mentioned. I do exactly what Sophia was explaining. I first get really, really scared and I stare at a white sheet for like two days. And then I go to sleep and I start to think about the idea in my head and I have a lot of dreams. For some reason for me, like at night, a lot comes to me. So the next day I just like write whatever's on my mind. And for me, I do all of that. And what helps also is the element of time. So leave it, come back to it the next day, maybe dream about, dream, dream about it at night, dream about the themes. Um, and then come back to it, reread re your work and all this other stuff comes to your head and you can fix stuff. Um, another thing that I think that helps if you are in a writer's room, for example, is making sure that you're in an environment where uh, that style is supported and inclusive. Um, like a lot of our writer's rooms, we literally sit around and just talk for like, if it's an eight hour room, these were in person, we could do eight hours. Now we can't do eight hours on Zoom because that's crazy. But um, like for the first four hours, we would just chat with each other and talk about life experiences and then jot ideas down and just stick them up on a wall. Um, and they were not fully formulated sentences. Some of them were just brain farts. They didn't mean anything. And it was a forgiving room where that was allowed. So I think surrounding yourself with other writers who have that same methodology is also a good way to get your creative juices going. Our next question, um, do you have any advice on pitching and putting together pitch packages? I feel like this could be a session in and of itself. Um, the other day, Hadiel and I were talking, maybe it was in preparation for this, and Hadiel, you were talking about how you, these days you pitch the story for what it is, as opposed to uh, putting the categories and descriptors before your character. And I love that. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I, I'd say it really comes, you know, back to the themes and, and really understanding uh, why you're pitching the thing you, you want to pitch. I think so long as, you know, you have a good sense of what that is and you make sure you're the right person to tell this story, then you know, the, the pitch will really resonate with people if it's coming from a really honest, uh, you know, really honest personal place. Um, and I, yeah, I do think a lot of people focus a lot on, you know, is the format of this pitch deck presentable? You know, are these designs as amazing as they could be? And they don't focus on sort of the why they're, they're even pitching it. So I would just say, keep that in mind most of all. And, and regardless of whether your pitch is on a piece of paper or a well-executed PowerPoint presentation, it, it'll really resonate with the right people. 
I have another question. Um, do you predict that the entertainment industry will continue to offer remote positions where possible following the COVID-19 pandemic to allow disabled creators to continue to be storytellers without using all of their spoons that is exhausting all of their physical, mental resources to keep up? Oh goodness, I hope so. Um, <laughs> I do think that uh, COVID was really quite huge for kind of bringing that shift into play. A lot of um, amazing creatives have been fighting for so long to have different avenues of, of getting in the room, quote unquote, um, especially remotely. And I think that as much as Zoom most certainly does not work for everyone, and there's a lot of challenges with it, and even for, for disabled folks, there's a lot of different disabilities that Zoom is not, not a friend to. Um, but I think it's opened the door to the fact that we can have multiple options. Um, and hopefully, my hope is that going forward, we take these things that we've learned and we take some of the things we were doing before and create um, rooms and meetings and, and processes and conferences that, um, that create space for people to engage in multiple, uh, multiple ways that work for them. Now, I'd like to wrap with one final question. Um, how do you balance the different parts of your career, acting, writing, et cetera? Do they go hand in hand or do you feel that one will take priority over the other? Yeah, um, as someone who was a student while you know acting on shows and pitching shows, I, I'd say it really does at the end of the day, take a lot of time management, sure, but a lot of sacrifices. I mean, often I just wake up really early and, and you know, start the school day and then go to acting work and then write for the rest of the day after getting home. Um, so I will say like, it does take a lot of balance overall. Um, currently these days I've found though that what helps is if you deal like, I guess like in shifts. So right now I'm leaning more towards like the writing and TV creating and the show running. And once those things get off the ground, maybe I can lean back to the acting. I think that, you know, an approach like that might be better if you do value socializing with people and having a break every once in a while, as opposed to, you know, balancing everything all at once. Um, but yeah, no, it, it definitely can take a toll on you. So don't strain yourself too much. All right. So Envision is now coming to an end, and I would like to close with a list of thank yous. So I would like to say thank you to our panelists, uh, Shabnam, Ophir, Hadiel. We are grateful for your time, energy, and your candid insight into the ongoing conversation. I'd like to give a very big shout out to the, the, to the entire team. So uh, Troy Bernard, our character designer, Paul Toscano, our animator, Ainara Alin, our voice actress, Lynn Val Winter, our music composer, Dylan Kerr, our background layout artist, Liz Kemada, our sound designer, Taylor Lewis Joseph, our event and communications consultant, Goen Lee, our art director and graphic designer for the pitch package, Jimmy Kwan, our audio lead and voiceover director, and Aya Saleh, our graphic designer for the event. I am grateful for all your dedication, your creativity, and for this collaboration. And anyone looking to work with these creatives, don't worry, their socials will be available on our Facebook event page. And last but certainly not least, Envision would not be possible without all of our sponsors. So I'd like to say thank you to FCAD, SIF, BRCDS, and Ryerson for supporting and seeing the value in initiatives like these. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a great night and enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>